Um, I thought I'd start by uh, recapping a few things that we talked about in the first lecture, which was just about MHD. Um, so just to remind you, MHD is a fluid theory. Um, what I mean when I say it's a fluid theory, I just mean that, uh, you know, first of all, the Debye length is infinitesimally small, which means that the system is, is what we call quasi-neutral. So on large scales, meaning scales above the Debye scale, uh, there's equal numbers of positive and, and negative charges. Um, the electric field is what uh, ensures that to happen. Um, so this is formally zero. The other things that are formally zero in MHD are the ion Larmor scale, which um, I, I gave you examples of uh, both in the no notes and on the board about just how small the ion Larmor scale is in a lot of astrophysical systems, which means that they're very well magnetized. Um, the other thing that's formally zero in MHD is the mean free path, uh, which is something that we're going to relax uh, in this lecture. Um, what this means for the particles, which is also what we're going to talk about in this lecture, is that to all orders in these equations, the distribution function is locally Maxwellian. So this is not the case in a lot of astrophysical and space systems, which will be um, highlighted in some of uh, Professor Quadrat's talks and um, whose physics will be discussed today in mine. Um, so MHD is a fluid theory. Uh, it, it's a fluid theory of infinitesimal fluid elements. Um, and these fluid elements are subject to the Lorentz force because in ideal MHD, the fluid is a fully, ideally conducting plasma. Of course, um, one of the things I said towards the end of the talk is that you can add resist resistive, you, you can lower the conductivity of the fluid either by adding a bunch of neutral particles into it or uh, just having collisions between electrons which disrupt the current. Um, between electrons and electrons, electrons and ions, and all these things disrupt the current and give you resistivity, just like Ohm's law. So today what we're going to do is relax these assumptions. If you remember the last thing that I said in the first lecture was we revisited the chart that I put in the notes, um, <clears throat> and I mentioned that a lot of the systems of interest uh, to modern um, astrophysical fluid dynamics aren't actually uh, in the ideal MHD regime. Um, despite the resistivity being small, uh, and this is because of issues related to the mean free path, the collisional mean free path. Uh, so some of those systems were the intracluster medium of galaxy clusters, um, the solar wind. Uh, if you go near the galactic center, so here it's just GC, um, so Sag A star. Uh, ideal MHD breaks down, and that's what, um, that's what this lecture is about. So just to give you some foreshadowing for where this is going to go, um, any discussion of kinetics uh, and even sometimes discussions of, of MHD start with particle motion. So I have a collection of particles. They're sitting in electric field or magnetic field. And regardless of whether those magnetic fields or electric fields are self-produced or whether they're external, you just investigate what the dynamics, you know, F equals MA, uh, of these particles are in these fields. That'll bring up a concept called guiding center motion. Um, and both of these things will lead to some uh, very important aspects of weakly collisional plasmas that stem from what's called adiabatic invariance. Uh, things like pressure and isotropy, by which I mean um, deviations from a Maxwellian distribution. Uh, right. So you can generalize MHD to account for some of these weakly collisional systems. You lead um, to something called the Braginsky MHD equations. Uh, so Braginsky did this, and um, there's a really nice monograph. Uh, I, I can actually send it to the organizers so it could be posted on the website from 1965, which is actually a good read. Um, I mean, it's technical, but it's, it's quite a good read. Um, and then also something uh, which I don't have enough board space to write the, uh, the authors, so it's just CGL. These are two goldenberger low equations. Um, and then ask the question, okay, we've weakened the collisions, now what if we just keep on weakening them? What if the collisions aren't strong enough to keep us anywhere near a Maxwellian distribution? And at that point, you have to give up on MHD uh, as, as a theory, and you have to just deal with kinetics. And so I'll talk about the Vlasov-Landau equation. I'm not going to derive it, because that's, there's a whole course at Princeton uh, in the plasma program devoted to the derivation of the Vlasov-Landau equation. Um, quickly see that the, the kinetic equation is much too general to do anything um, 
uh, in finite time on a computer or on pencil and paper. And so you have to come up with some ordering parameters. Basically, for the system of interest, what are the small parameters in your system, and can you expand these equations in these small parameters to get something more tractable than the full 60 uh, Vlasov-Maxwell set of equations? Um, that'll lead us to something called kinetic MHD, which is generally attributable to Russell Colesrud, who is a professor here in the plasma program and the astro program. Um, I'm gonna just highlight three features that you can pull out of kinetic MHD. One's called Barnes damping, sometimes called transit time damping. It's an example of collisionless damping, which is something that you um, get in when, when you deal with kinetics. Uh, the other two things are fire hose and mirror instabilities, which um, have taken on a life of their own in sort of modern astrophysical plasmas, and uh, I believe they're also going to be mentioned um, in the subsequent talk in the context of the solar wind. Uh, and then I thought I would give a little preview of gyrokinetics, which has long been the workhorse um, in the fusion community, uh, but is now making inroads into the astrophysics community, and it's sort of one of the advanced tools that um, a practitioner of astrophysical plasma dynamics really ought to pick up as part of their toolkit. Um, of course, I can't derive this for you at the board because it's just, you know, it'll take two hours, but uh, it's in the notes, which I hope that uh, you've looked at because it took me some time. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, it's an advanced topic. If you've never seen it before, I give sort of a pedestrian uh, derivation of gyrokinetics in a homogeneous plasma um, uh, in the notes. I also provide a derivation of kinetic MHD in the notes, which I'm going to skip over a lot of the details of the derivation, but that's what this packet's for. Um, right, so let's get started. Once again, just like in the first lecture, there's, there's a huge range of backgrounds um, in the audience, so uh, in contrast to the first lecture, I'm not gonna let this hold me back as much because I think it's important that many of you who are familiar with MHD and even some basic kinetics see what are some of the advanced topics, and I apologize if this leaves some of you in the dust, but you'll, you'll come around to it eventually, and at least I hope the notes here provide you with some, some guidance as you come around to it. Um, right, so the first thing is part particle motion. And um, <clears throat> you know, one can set up an electric field, one can set up a magnetic field and put a single particle down and say, how does this particle move? And I'm gonna skip a few steps because what you learn really quickly is that there's two types of motion. Uh, so let me just draw this picture. We have some coordinate system and there's some particle here uh, at some position, which I'll call little r. And um, this particle, you know, I'm taking it for granted that you know that particles spiral along magnetic field lines. Uh, here's this magnetic field. So this particle is executing Larmor motion with some Larmor radius rho. If we were to promote that Larmor radius into a vector, it would look like that. It's just pointing from the magnetic field line to the current position of the particle, and of course this vector sweeps around uh, with a gyro phase that just oscillates in time. Um, and what you'll quickly find when you start looking at particle motion is that it makes a good deal of sense to define this big R, which is pointing to the guiding center, what's called the guiding center. Um, so if a particle is executing some Larmor motion, the center of that uh, Larmor motion is referred to as the guiding center. And why this split is important, uh, you can see right away. I mean, the, the evolution of rho, uh, the vector that's pointing to the particle, is sinusoidal. But the, vector, the, the uh, evolution of the guiding center need not be sinusoidal. Um, for example, if this particle was just, if this particle were just streaming along the magnetic field line, the guiding center motion would just, you know, be like that. And it's really helpful to decompose the particle motion into what the guiding center is doing and what the individual particle is doing as it oscillates about the gyro center. Um, so just to give you a formula here, which you could just extract from, from this plot. 
it's just minus V cross B uh, divided by the gyro frequency. So remember, omega here is just gyro frequency, which is in, in CGS units, <laughs> is QB over MC. And um, just to remind you from the first letter, uh, from the first lecture, I, I represent the magnetic field unit vector as just a little b with a, with a carrot on top. Good. So, uh, what is the uh, evolution of the guiding center? We know what the evolution of rho is. It just spins around in a circle. It's quite boring. Um, but where does the actual guiding center move? So here's R, and I put a little time derivative on it, and I know that uh, from this plot, R is little r minus rho. It's just, you know, pointing that way. So I have this. And I know F equals MA plenty fine. I know kinematics, so you can uh, say, you know, R dot is the velocity of the particle, of course. Um, rho dot, I have my formula here, and what we'll do just for the time being is we're going to consider uh, B uniform, E uniform, uh, one, yeah, <laughs> and time independent. So kind of a boring situation, but you also, um, you already get some interesting behavior. So when I take this time derivative of this, I'm just going to keep b hat constant because it's just a uniform field. I'm going to keep omega constant because it's a uniform field. And so this time derivative is just going to hit uh, v. And of course, v dot is just the acceleration. And we all know the Lorentz force. So this is um, q over m, e plus v cross b, just the Lorentz force on the charge. And then we have cross it with B divided by the frequency of the particle. <clears throat> now, V cross B cross B just ends up being minus the perpendicular component of, of the velocity, you know, once you do your back cab rule. Uh, and what you're left with Makes me nervous with so many people sitting in the back. Can you read this? Yeah? OK. Um, so what you're left with is two types of motion. Uh, parallel here, I just mean parallel to the magnetic field. So the, the, the particle, the guiding center of the particle is streaming along the magnetic field at some velocity. And uh, interestingly enough, it's drifting across the magnetic field uh, with some E cross B drift. So this is called E cross B drift. I imagine most of you have seen this before. Um, this is actually what underlies MHD, is that all the particles, uh, independent of their species, you notice there's no charge here, there's no mass here, you know. Independent of the species, all the particles are E cross B drifting. And this is what underlies um, MHD, is that this flow in MHD is ordered with the sound speed, which means it's a fast drift, and this is what gives you uh, alphane waves and things like this. Good. So we have a particle ex executing Larmor motion about a, a guiding center. That guiding center is just running straight along the magnetic field. And as it does so, it's performing these E cross B drifts. Um, what I should also, well, actually, here, let me draw a picture for you first of what the E cross B drift looks like. So if I have some sort of uniform electric field like this, and I have some magnetic field that's out of the board. You know, I just orient it this way because it's easy to take cross products. Um, normally, without the electric field, uh, this thing is just going to execute Larmor motion, right? So it's just going to go in a circle. Um, if I pick a particular charge, it's going to go in a particular direction. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to label four points of interest in the orbit. So if there were no electric field, the particles just execute Larmor motion, and that's exactly what it would look like. Now, if you include the electric field, um, this particle is going to get accelerated, because electric fields accelerate 
uh, charges. So as that particle is executing its Larmor motion, once it, once it leaves point number one, it's going to get accelerated by the electric field because it's going in the direction of the, the electric field. And what you need to remember is that the Larmor radius, uh, or the gyro radius of a particle, is V perp divided by omega. So omega here is just fixed, right? Because we have a homogeneous constant magnetic field. But this is not going to be fixed because this particle is sitting uh, in an accelerating electric field. So as this particle goes this way and it starts to get accelerated, its Larmor radius is going to grow. And so instead of coming back here, like in that diagram, it's going to have a larger Larmor radius. So here's, here's the new point now. So from one to two, uh, V perp goes, goes up because you're accelerating because of the electric field. Now, as that particle comes back down this way, now it's fighting, it's fighting uphill, right? So it's trying to go against the flow, uh, and it starts to slow down. So in going from two to three, V perp starts to slow down, which means that the Larmor radius starts to shrink. Right, so instead of having this large circle, I'll complete that one, it starts to shrink. So now it's all the way down here. So you notice it's drifted. Right? It's not, it's not going to close back on the, on the circle at which it started. As it comes back up, it's going to start getting accelerated again by the electric field, and so the Larmor race is going to start to grow because V perp is going up, and then you're just going to have a cycle like this, and it'll just keep on going. And, you know, lo and behold, whip out your, your right hand, and this is the E cross B direction. <clears throat> so this is absolutely crucial in MHD. It underlies uh, the perpendicular dynamics of the particles. Uh, it's what's behind things like Alfane waves. Um, it's the E cross B drift. And in MHD, this is um, the dominant drift uh, in the system. So let me push. Nah. I think I'll be a little smarter today with my use of the boards. Uh, there we go. Okay. So what's really important to note about the E cross B drift is, like I, like I already said, but I'm just I'm saying everything twice for a reason. Um, it's species independent. So whether it's an ion or electron, it'll have a different Larmor scale, right, because the masses are different of the particles, but they'll all be drifting in the same direction, which means that the E cross B drifts introduce no current. Right? Now, if instead of some electric field, you have just some general force. Instead of QE, you just have some force like gravity uh, or curvature or grab B, things that I'm going to talk about. Um, you could easily uh, just generalize that formula um, to be C F cross B over Q B squared. And, you know, if the force doesn't depend on the properties of the particles at all, which, you know, things like um, uh, gradients in the magnetic field or curvature of the field lines, um, you see that the, the dependence of the drifts is now on the charge. So electrons are going to drift one way different than the ions, and these kinds of drifts will introduce currents because of that. Good, so this is the simplest example of uh, particle drifts. So let's make things a little more complicated. Um, let's make the magnetic field to be non-uniform. We'll, we'll st still keep it static. Uh, 
course, you don't have to. You can do this exercise with having a time variable electric field or a uh, inhomogeneous electric field. Just do one thing at a time. So if you repeat this whole calculation, you'll notice that there was some point up there where we took the time derivative of the, the Larmor radius, right? And what we did was that time derivative only hit the velocity because as that particle moved along this trajectory, the magnetic field wasn't changing at all. The difference now is that as the particle moves along some trajectory, the magnetic field that it sees is changing because it's sitting in a non-uniform field. So um, this time derivative, d by dt, uh, it's going to have this effective term. You know, this is the same thing as the big D by dt that I was talking about before. So it's a time derivative taken along a particle trajectory. So as, as you move along this particle trajectory, the magnetic field changes, which means when we take rho dot, we have to worry about uh, gradients in the magnetic field. So if you take that into consideration, um, you have the same, here, I'll just skip this step. Uh, you have the same thing as before, streaming along the magnetic field line. E cross B drifting across the magnetic field. But then you have this extra term, because as the particle goes along its trajectory, it sees a time rate of change of the magnetic uh, direction and the magnetic um, field strength. So what I do in the notes is you can just compute this. It's just some vector algebra. Um, what I'm going to do here is just motivate it uh, physically. So you know, streaming e cross b drift, this is going to give two things, which is called grad b drift. and something called curvature drift. And from a mathematical point of view, you can just, just crunch this, right? It's just some vector analysis. But you can get the same answers by, by just being a little witty about the physics. Uh, and that's what we'll do uh, here. So if we go back to this formula, if I have some force uh, and that force is directed perpendicular to the, the magnetic field, we're going to have a drift. So instead of thinking mathematically and just doing this, we can try to associate some force with uh, the fact that a particle might be sitting in a non-uniform field, or we could associate some force with the fact that the magnetic field lines might be curving. These forces are kind of obvious, right? What happens? in a curved trajectory, you have a centrifugal force. So that's one of the forces that we could just plug into this drift formula. Um, what happens when we're in a non-uniform magnetic field? Well, if you remember from E and M, the force um, on a dipole is just grad of mu dot B. So if you don't remember, what a dipole is, that's the dipole formula. And after some simplification, this is what that is. You know, this, this should look quite familiar, right? This is just the magnetic moment of a particle. So you take a particle, it's moving perpendicular to the field lines. In a magnetic field, it's got some mass. Uh, that's a magnetic moment and it's oriented along the magnetic field. And if you want to compute the force on that dipole, you just dot it with B and take the gradient. <clears throat> so if you take this and you stick it into our drift formula and you cross it with B, um, you get a, a grab B drift. looks like this. So let me draw a picture of what this looks like. 
So you'll get the same exact answer if you just go computing v dot grad b over omega and you just average over the Larmor orbit, you'll get the same exact thing. That's done in the notes. So what does this look like? Um, let's have a magnetic field out of the board, which is increasing to the right. So grab B is in this direction. So you whip out your right hand and, you know, uh, B cross grab B. So there should be some drift of the particle as it undergoes Larmor motion up, up the board. And how to understand that is that if you're a particle executing some large gyro motion about this field line and you come swinging over this way, you're encountering a region where B is strong, right? And, you know, if you go all the way back to the definition of um, the Larmor radius, it's inversely proportional to the strength of the magnetic field. So as this particle enters the strong field region, its Larmor radius is going to shrink, which means it'll go like this. And then it comes back out and it enters a region of weak field, so the Larmor radius grows, and it ends up drifting. So once again, you have a superposition of just standard Larmor motion and a guiding center drift. And that's grab B drift. Right, so there's also curvature drift, which I'm not going to do um, on the board, but it's in the notes. That's the reason you have the notes, so I don't have to do everything on the board. But it's quite simple. You just take... Um, Centrifugal force, which is this mv perp squared over the radius of curvature of the field lines as the particle streams along the field, and you just plug this into this formula, and that will give you the curvature drift. The idea there is that as a particle is following a magnetic field line, it's accelerating uh, because it's getting whipped around by the field. With that acceleration comes a, a guiding center drift perpendicular to both the acceleration and the magnetic field. You can also do things like um, have a time-varying electric field or time-varying magnetic field. I'm not going to talk about those here. I, I refer to you in the notes to um, this textbook by Goldstone and Rutherford, which in the chapter four has a really nice discussion of all the different drifts, things called polarization drifts and inertial drifts and things like that. They're not crucial to anything else that follows for the rest of the week, so I'm, I'm just not going to talk about them. But if you're interested in these things, um, I think that chapter in particular in that textbook is quite, quite nice. Um, let's see. It's like that game where you slide something and then you want to get as close as possible without smacking into it. <laughs> okay. So um, we did particle motion, we did guiding center motion. So the next thing is something called adiabatic invariance. So if you ever took a course, which I hope you did, in Hamiltonian mechanics, you'll learn that these things called Poincaré invariants, which are just conserved quantities in the system that are associated with some sort of periodic motion. Um, in plasma physics, we refer to adiabatic invariants, which are approximate values, I mean, they're approximations to these Poincaré invariants. They're things that are, uh, well, well, we'll see that they're conserved to sort of exponentially small precision, provided certain conditions are met. Um, so, right, so adiabatic invariance. <clears throat> so these are associated with some sort of periodic motion. Um, that the particles undergo. And, you know, we've already talked about one sense of periodic motion, which is just that the Larmor radius of the particle sweeps around in a circle with some gyrophase that's time dependent. So that's one type of motion that's periodic in the system, and that's just in, induced by having a strong magnetic field, 
strong enough so that these Larmor motions um, are fast. Uh, there's another periodic sense of, man uh, of, uh, of motion that's induced by the magnetic field, and that's associated with these drifts. So suppose the guiding center somehow, um, while it's executing these drifts, it might get reflected and bounce back and forth uh, in some sort of magnetic bottle, which I'll, I'll draw a picture of. You know, that's another sense of periodic motion. And for each of these periodic motions, there's some adiabatic uh, quantity that's associated with this periodic motion, which is approximately conserved. So that's what I'll talk about. Now, so the first adiabatic invariant we've already written down on the board. It's just the magnetic moment of the particle. Um, so general form of adiabatic invariance you know, in classical mechanics speak, it looks like this. There's some canonical momentum and there's some generalized coordinate that's associated with it, and you're taking this integral over some sort of periodic loop. Um, so in this case, the momentum is just the angular momentum of a particle as it executes Larmor motion, and the, um, the coordinate that's associated with that is just this gyro phase. So you've got uh, a particle Going around, it's got some angular momentum, mv times the Larmor radius. And there's some sort of angular coordinate that's associated with that uh, periodic motion. It's just called the gyro phase. So it's quite easy algebra just to take mv perp rho and make sure it's conserved, and you plug in uh, rho right there, and you see you have two powers of E perp, which is there, and then one over omega, which gives you a one over B. So this is quite important uh, for the, f well, let me, let me draw this visually first. So here's a magnetic field, it's into the plane of the board, and suppose I have some particle um, that's doing that. So the question would be, let me see, yeah, I'll do this. The question here is what happens to this particle if I very slowly weaken the magnetic field. So may I just expand it a little bit. What I mean by slowly is, suppose I go from this configuration of the field to this configuration field on a time scale much longer than the particle executes its Larmor motion. And that's where the term adiabatic comes in, right? You have to do this slowly. What will happen? Well, you can you know, integrate this orbit using conservation of the magnetic moment, and what you'll see is that the the uh, perpendicular velocity of the particle will adjust. It'll decrease. So if B goes down, V perp has to go down. So this is roughly a constant. Another reason why I draw it like this is that um, you can count the number of field lines that threaded this Larmor orbit, and you see that they're the same. So the particles like to conserve the amount of flux that's flowing through a Larmor uh, orbit. So you can think about this thing two ways. You can think about it as just conserving flux in the Larmor orbit, or you can think about it in terms of just conservation of angular momentum of, of a particle. In the notes, that I, I just I prove that it's conserved mathematically, and I apply it to something called math, uh, magnetic mirroring, which I think is something that's going to show up in, in uh, Professor Barnes' talk, um, I think tomorrow. Okay, so that's, that's one. Hmm. Right. <laughs> it's like Tetris. Uh, oh, this is not movable. Okay. Well, I'll just erase this. <laughs> <laughs>
All right, so there's one uh, adiabatic invariance mu. I should say that you can show that this is conserved. Um, what is it? Right? Yeah, to that precision. So here, omega is like the frequency at which you're changing this magnetic field that I drew, sort of an uh, inverse time scale over which the magnetic field changes, and this is the Larmor uh, gyration. So you see this, is, this could be an extremely small number. So this is the precision to which mu is conserved. Um, often you say that this is conserved uh, to all orders. The idea being that you can express this as just a Taylor series um, in which you can start counting orders. Okay, so there's a second adiabatic invariant. which is written a bit more cryptically. Um, so this is some sort of length. Actually, I shouldn't write that. This is some sort of path along B. This is, as usual, the velocity of the particle along the magnetic field. Technically, this is, this is the, um, I should say, it's the guiding center motion. Guiding center motion um, parallel to B. And that's just the mass of the particle that's undergoing this. So why would the path along a magnetic field have anything to do with a periodic quantity? Suppose you had a magnetic field like this. So here's just a bundle of field lines. I'm going to pinch them at one end and pinch them at the other and have the center balloon out. And I'll have some particle that's doing Larmor motion. And its guiding center has some velocity parallel to the magnetic field. So many of you already know what's going to happen when that particle gets down here, right? Is somebody going to say it or it's hard? <laughs> It'll bounce back, yeah. The idea there is that the energy of this particle is conserved and the magnetic moment of this particle is conserved. So if it enters a region where the B is strong, that means V perp has to go up, which means V parallel has to go down if you conserve energy. So eventually this, um, this particle's parallel velocity is going to go down. It'll come to some point where V parallel is zero, and then it'll reflect and it'll go back the other way and it'll do the same thing on the other side and it'll just keep on bouncing back and forth. And then you have periodic motion, um, periodic motion due to mirroring. And this is the thing that's conserved during that periodic motion. What this means is that if I uh, lengthen or contract the path along this magnetic field, then V parallel has to change. So if I take that structure and I make it something like this, uh, V parallel has to increase. So those are two adiabatic invariants. There's a third invariant, which is associated with magnetic flux, then you know, it just doesn't enter into anything I'm going to say after this, so I'm not going to talk about it. Um, so these are, uh, these are two really important quantities. This integral with the loop is there is just because this is a periodic motion and we're going to take this integral over the whole path. So you, you start from A and you go over here to B and then you come back to A and that's your path integral. For this, for this, yeah. The implicit assumption here is there's no relative losses. Yeah, yeah. That actually, um, that'll come back in a few pages. Uh, right. 
These are adiabatic invariants, but you can imagine cases in which they would be spoiled. You know, one would be radiative losses if these particles are just losing energy, which I argued by, I argued this whole thing by conservation of energy. So if something disrupted the energy of the particle, that's one thing. If you had collisions between particles, of course, that's going to screw up all the pitch angles of the particles and it's going to break these sorts of things. Um, the point though is in a lot of the systems of interest, the collisions are weak enough that these things are still conserved approximately. Okay, good. So any, any more questions about, uh, this is all I'm going to say about guiding center motion and about adiabatic invariance. Adiabatic invariance is going to imply things about the bulk properties of the plasma, which is what I'm going to talk about now. But as far as actual particle motion, this is all I'm going to say. Okay. Good. Let's bring some of these boards back. You all did your own linear theory, right? <laughs> There's nothing better to do on a sweaty day. <laughs> okay. So adiabatic invariance. All right, so the next thing on the list is pressure isotropy. So let's start thinking about a collection of particles. So we've only talked about each individual particle and what each individual particle does, but it's a, we're interested in plasmas, which are collections. So what we would like to do is if we look at the magnetic moment of a collection of particles and we average over that entire collection, sort of like an expectation value like you take in quantum mechanics. So if we take the expectation value, and here we're going to integrate over the distribution. So it's just the, the probability of finding a particle uh, with some velocity within this, this uh, infinitesimal chunk of velocity space. Uh, what is this? So um, you have one half m v perp squared over b f phase space integral. This is just the definition of density, right? If you just count up all the particles in your probability distribution function over all of the velocity space, this is just the density of the number of particles. That's how f is defined. Um, this right here is p perp. This is the definition of p perp. I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. So if every particle conserves its mu as a whole, a fluid element that contains all these particles has a certain temperature as it sits in a magnetic field. And the reason why there's a perp here is that the temperature of these particles, uh, so the energy content and the random motion of these particles would be different along the magnetic field versus across the magnetic field. Why would they be different? Well, I just told you that if you, have, if you change B in a system, you have to change V perp. I didn't say anything about V parallel in this, in this statement. So, you know, if you count up all the random motions of the particles, the fact that this thing is conserved means that there's a bias in the system. And that's what, uh, that's what the statement is, is that if you change B, you introduce a bias in the thermal content of the particles perpendicular to the magnetic field versus parallel to the magnetic field. You can do the same thing with J. Um, Uh, whoops, F. The complicated part here is you have to know now what the, what is the length of the magnetic field associated with this bouncing motion. And it turns out that given the, the parameters in the problem, there's only one choice that you can make. And that's B over N. 
Where this comes from is if you conserve flux, we have, you know, br squared is conserved. And if you conserve mass, this is nr cubed. So the only length scale that you have out of the system is b over n. So if you plug that in here and you do this uh, integral, I'll just skip to the answer. It's in the notes. You have this. So these, this is pretty much the most important two statements um, for trying to extend MHD to a system of weakly collisional particles. When I mean weakly, I just mean uh, not so many collisions that these invariants are broken just by scattering. So what this means is that if you change the magnetic field in the plasma, you have to double the, thir like if you double the field, you have to double the thermal content of the particles perpendicular to the field. And that's just from mu conservation. This says that if you change uh, B or the density uh, in, you know, in some way that this isn't a constant, then the, the parallel um, random motions of the particles have to adjust so that the, the temperature that describes those motions um, has to adjust. So there's, a, there's another way of writing this. You know, I expect that when I do this, when I achieve that, all of you will cheer. <laughs> all right, so there's a nice way of writing this in terms of a fluid. Um, So in a co-moving, if you take a time derivative, co-moving with the fluid element, remember that big D by dt, these quantities uh, uh, satisfy these equations. So this is called double, adi double adiabatic. And it replaces, yeah, replaces that single fluid adiabatic law that we talked about in the first, in the first lecture. What I do in the notes is that if you uh, combine these in some suitable way, if you define the total pressure as two-thirds P per plus one-third P parallel, which you can prove, you can actually achieve something like this equation by adding these two together in suitable ways. That's done in the notes. So you can, you can reproduce something that looks like a single, a single pressure adiabatic type of equation of state from these double adiabatic equations of state with some subtleties. It's done in the notes. So uh, if I were to give a reference for this, um, this is, it's actually, it's another, it's another really nice paper. Um, was it 56? Yeah. That you can, um, it's got a lot of physical discussion in it about these adiabatic invariants. So this gentleman who asked the question about radiation, that would be one thing that would go on the right-hand side of these equations, right? I already said there's something else that would go on the right-hand side of these equations, which is collisions. Collisions always push you back towards a Maxwellian, and these equations are pushing you away from that, right? So 
Uh, these equations are pushing you away from a clean isotropic uh, distribution function. Um, so collisions would live on the right-hand side and they would push you back. Can you think of anything else that might be on the, on the right-hand side? Uh, well, yes and no. It depends what you mean by turbulence. So um, if by turbulence you mean fluctuations in magnetic field and, and density, that's included. Right? If, you're, if you're in a turbul turbulent bath and the magnetic field's fluctuating, that's in this equation already. Pair production. Pair production. I'm not going there. <laughs> conduction. Yeah, conduction. Um, so this equation says nothing about redistributing p perp or p parallel, right? So if you go back to this adiabatic equation and if you learn something about uh, dissipation, MH, MHD with dissipation, you'll remember things on the right-hand side, which are viscous dissipation that are associated with molecular viscosity um, that leads to heating. There's cooling, like you talked about. There's also conduction. And just like in single fluid ideal, or non-ideal MHD, you would have some conduction term on the right-hand side. Um, there will be conduction terms on the right-hand sides of these double adiabatic equations. The problem now is what temperature do you put in your conduction? Right, there's two temperatures now. So we're gonna come back to that uh, question a bit later. For now, we're gonna ignore any heat flows which turns out uh, there are some limits in which you can rigorously do that, even when there are temperature gradients. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to take the difference of these two equations. And I'll just write the answer. It's done in the notes. Uh, So if I just take the difference of these two equations, it's all I've done, I get this. Um, so if you change the magnetic field strength or you change the density, you produce anisotropy in the distribution function, which is biased, uh, parallel, and perpendicular to the magnetic field, and these arise because of adiabatic invariance. Um, we just talked about heat flows and collisions. So heat flows. that redistribute this anisotropy between different chunks of the fluid. Uh, we talked about cooling or heating. I guess I'll just do that. Um, if the cooling or the heating is biased in some way, for example, if you're only cooling parallel motions of the particles, you know, this would introduce an anisotropy if you're only cooling one degree of freedom of the particle. Um, and then I talked about collisions. And what you can show rigorously, which is, which is done in the notes, uh, is that there should be a term like this. So what this means is that there's collisions. If those collisions are strong, they isotropize the distribution. You know, they push you back towards a Maxwellian. Um, let's see. So an equation like this uh, is in this paper, uh, Chu, Goldberger, and Lowe, with, with the actual heat flows and everything. So th this is one version of what's called the CGL equations. <clears throat> okay, half hour, good. Good, um, okay, so that's pressure and isotropy. Those are CGL equations, um, which are uh, written and, and discussed a bit more than I have done in the notes. Um, so something called Braginsky MHD. So a lot of the systems, um, so the solo wind, the mean free path is an AU, which is huge. But there are some systems where the mean free path isn't zero, I mean, it cannot formally be taken to zero like it is in the MHD approximation, but it is 
still slightly smaller than some macroscopic, macroscopic scales of interest. In that case, you can adopt the following ordering. You can say, I have some frequencies which characterize my time rate of change in my fields. And these, uh, these frequencies are smaller than the collision frequency, which are smaller than the gyro, gyro frequency, the Larmor frequency. And in this situation, you can come back to this equation and you can say, what are the biggest terms in this equation? Right. So I already said, let's not worry about the heat flows. So um, don't worry about that. I'm never going to talk about cooling or heating in this talk. Um, so we have a collision frequency times a pressure and isotropy. And over here, we have a rate of change times a pressure and isotropy. And in this ordering, which uh, holds very well uh, for most scales in the intracluster medium, um, some scales in, in uh, the galactic center, if you go far enough out, um, this term is dominant, right? And this entire left-hand side can be dropped because it's order some frequency times the pressure isotropy, which is much, much smaller than the collision frequency. Yes? Oh, they're like, where is this voice coming from? Um, right, so, uh, yeah, up to this point, I've sort of dodged questions of, um, of the distribution function itself, right? I've just been talking about aspects of the distribution function on some, in some fluid sense. Um, one distribution function that's often used that uh, exhibits this anisotropy is called a bimaxwellian. So it's like a Maxwellian, but there's two temperature, right, in two different directions of the magnetic field. I'm glad you brought that up, because we're going to come back to this, actually. Because you can prove that this distribution function is unstable. All right, so this ordering underlies uh, this work by Braginsky. Um, it's a really nice paper, like I said before. It's, read it quite well. Um, it's something else I'll, I'll send to the organizer so it'll be posted on the, on the website, because sometimes it, it's a bit hard to find. Right, so let's come back here. We have, this is just adiabatic production of pressure isotropy, right? You, according to these conservation of magnetic moment and, and the, the, the bounce invariant J, if you change the magnetic field and the density uh, in, uh, in time, this is going to produce a pressure isotropy and that thing is going to be relaxed by collisions because the system always wants to go back to a Maxwellian uh, if it can afford to do so. If you neglect the heat flows and any cooling or heating, you get a closure, which says that the pressure and isotropy is that. So this is a balance between adiabatic production and collisional relaxation. <coughs> now what I do in my notes, uh, it's just a few lines so you, you can check it, is um, if you go back to the induction equation and the continuity equation, you know what the rate of change of B is and the rate of change of the density is from, from both of those equations. And so you can rewrite this as follows. 
So if you're not familiar with this kind of tensorial dot notation, um, That's what I mean. It's a double dot product. Okay, good. So we've discussed um, where pressure and isotropy might come from. They come from adiabatic invariance of the particles. We've figured out that in a certain limit, you can write down a closed form expression for the anisotropy, which comes from balancing adiabatic production with collisional relaxation. Now we just have to figure out what to do with this. <laughs> Um, so let's go all the way back to <clears throat> the momentum equation that I talked about yesterday. And Varro. So you can add any additional forces that you want to this equation, of course, but this is, this is basically it, an ideal MHD. So where is pressure isotropy in this equation? Right? It's not there. The reason it's not there is because in MHD, formally, the mean free path is zero, which means that the collision rate is infinite. Right? So in MHD, this is formally zero because this thing is huge. So we have to relax that in the momentum equation somehow. here for me. So one way of doing that is to promote P to a tensor instead of scalar. And so you have a divergence of a tensor instead of just the gradient of a scalar. And this tensor, I proved this in the notes, uh, but I'm just stating it here. Because of these adiabatic invariants, it has a bias. So this pressure tensor is diagonal in a frame that's centered along with the magnetic field direction. So it's just a diagonal tensor, but it's not P, P, P along the diagonal like it is in, in uh, uh, Maxwellian plasma. There's P perp in these perpendicular directions, and there's P parallel in the parallel directions. And so, we have an expression for p parallel minus p perp, and we could just stick it in here. And that is, um, that's Braginsky's correction to, to MHD. Now, there's something I want you to notice is that there's a gradient of pressure. So we've got one gradient, and then if we stick that in here, here's another gradient, right? So there's two gradients and a d by dt on the left-hand side. That's a diffusion equation, right? D by dt equals something, blah, 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 coefficient, uh, gradient, gradient times u, which means it's a viscosity, right? But it's a funky viscosity. It's not just an isotropic viscosity. It's a viscosity that knows about the magnetic field direction. Um, and so I'll say some words about why that happens or how that happens. And I'm going to... Um, Twenty minutes. Any questions here so far? I feel like I should check on, check in on you every once in a while. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. It's not clear to me that there wouldn't be terms that showed up from the back reaction of the particles on the field. Um, so um, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by the, the last little piece of what you asked, but... Is, is there a way to physically see why there aren't some added terms to the, uh, the last part, the field term? Yeah. Um, there are, actually. Uh, and I'm dropping them. So... Um, 
I'll answer his question in a bit of a different way. Uh, I'll, I'll ask, a, it's the classic politician, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer a question that you didn't ask. <laughs> um, yeah, but it, it's related. So um, if you go later in the notes, uh, this is done in the notes, I'm not going to do it on the board. You know, what I've done here is I've argued for an equation that looks like this. I haven't actually derived it rigorously. What you would do rigorously is you would take a kinetic equation, you would start taking moments of that, you would identify the fast time scales in the system, and, uh, and as you take these moments, take into consideration these time scale hierarchies here, you will get this equation with this closure. Um, there are additional terms that have been ordered out because of this ordering. There are things like finite Larmor radius effects. So if the Larmor scale of the orbit is comparable to, this, to the uh, fluctuations that you're interested in, um, there will be an additional term in this pressure tensor called gyro viscosity. So I've only, this is, this piece right here is the leading order uh, contribution to the pressure stress in this ordering. If you start to relax some of these orderings, the next, the, there's, there's uh, additional terms that you add on. Some of those have heat fluxes. Remember that I said that I dropped? Those become important in, in what's called a low Mach ordering. So if the Mach number of the flow is very, very small, those heat fluxes enter into this equation. They're, those are actually discussed in the notes. They're due to Mikhail, Mikhailovsky and, and Sippen um, in the early 80s. Uh, there's also a gyro viscous stress that you could add on to here um, that accounts for finite Larmor radius effects. All these things are actually in Braginsky. They're in, they're in the notes. I'm just concentrating on the leading order term. Yeah. Okay. So physically, what is, what is this? Um, so we have a viscosity. What is viscosity? Viscosity is uh, the collisional communication of a momentum between two fluid elements. Right. Um, so why are all these Bs interfering with that process? And the reason is that if you had a magnetic field line with a fluid element and another magnetic field line with a fluid element right there, so there's a bunch of particles in here and they're executing Larmor motion like that. And because of this ordering, this Larmor motion is confined to a very small perpendicular region, right? The Larmor radius is very small for the particles in this fluid element. And so it's incredibly difficult for a particle here, uh, which comprises this fluid element, um, to communicate collisionally with these guys. Because in order to do that, they would have to cross the field. Now, if there's another fluid element right here that has particles in it, I mean, these particles could just stream along the magnetic field. There's nothing blocking them along the magnetic field except for collisions. So what this equation says is that there is a viscosity, but that viscosity can only target uh, motions that are uh, along a shared magnetic field line. Um, that's what this double dot product is. It means I can only relax uh, gradients that are along the magnetic field, because across the magnetic field, communication is difficult. And I can only target flows that are along the magnetic field um, because, uh, well, for the same reason that I just said. Um, so what this uh, is often referred to is anisotropic, uh, or sometimes just Braginsky, viscosity. So it's a viscous-like term. There's two gradients. There's a collision frequency, and there's a, there's a velocity, but then there's all these unit vectors that get in the way, which have to do with the restriction of the transport to be flowing along the magnetic field instead of across the magnetic field. Good. Okay. So this is very different from MHD, right? The only anisotropy introduced into MHD is due to the Lorentz force. It's only in the momentum equation. But now we have a plasma where the transport uh, is also anisotropic. So the whole thing gets, 
gets nasty. Um, I'm not going to derive it like I did here. Uh, I'm just going to write it down. The heat flux, if there's a heat flux in the system, um, for the same exact reason that I've talked about here, instead of just being some conductivity or some diffusion coefficient times a gradient of T, which is what you usually get in like the heat equation, now there's these BBs. So what this means is that heat flows are only generated by parallel gradients of temperature, and that heat is only flowing along the magnetic field. So this is called anisotropic conduction, or Braginsky conduction, or... And the physics is exactly the same as here, right? Uh, if you want to communicate, instead of momentum, if you want to communicate heat from that field line to this field line, you're thwarted by the Larmor radii being tiny. It's really hard to collisionally communicate uh, across field lines. So, um, but you can readily communicate heat along the field, and that's exactly what this does. So once again, it, you, you, you have this BB type of tensor that goes dotting into these gradients in the system, which are, are, which are trying to be collisionally relaxed. Good, so on page 54 of the notes, I put anisotropic conduction, I put anisotropic viscosity into the MHD equations. Uh, the full set is written there, so you can, you can check it out. I believe that um, in the next lecture, no, not in the lect lecture, but this, Professor Quadrat, at, at, uh, I think in his second lecture, is going to talk about the consequences of some of these things. Um, it turns out, uh, you know, despite the stuff being known to the plasma community since the 60s, um, there's actually a lot of surprises still occurring in the astrophysical plasma community who's just sort of waking up to this kind of stuff. Um, so it's, it's good that you're young and learning it now instead of, you know, later. Okay, um, so in the last 15 minutes, I'm going to talk about a situation where the collisions aren't strong enough to keep you close to a Maxwellian. So in MHD, the distribution function is always Maxwellian. In this Braginsky ordering, the distribution function is close to Maxwellian. Uh, we've basically picked up the first order correction, which is this pressure isotropy. So while I'm erasing, I'll just talk a bit about Kinetics, um, so one reason that doing these kinds of fluid theories is useful is because kinetics is um, it's a very, very rich subject, right? Uh, everything here that we've written down has been three-dimensional. Once you go to kinetics and you have to start worrying about departures from a Maxwellian, uh, which might be large, then you have to start worrying about velocity space structure and the problem becomes 6D. So you've, you've doubled the number of dimensions in the problem. Uh, there's also a bunch of kinetic physics that is not an MHD that you have to worry about. Um, you, know, you could teach a whole course on just kinetic theory of plasmas and still not cover everything. In fact, uh, in the plasma program here, there's like three courses on kinetic physics just to cover basic kinetic theory. Um, and I've got 15 minutes. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> um, so, the first thing is why so we, okay, so all these, all these are done. So talk about this now, and that's going to lead to vlasov landau equation. So kinetic equation. A kinetic equation is just a, st a statistical description of a plasma. So you might want to ask right away, you know, why are we mucking around with MHD? Why are we going to derive, well, I'm not going to derive it here, but a statistical theory for a plasma. Why can't we just take a Hamiltonian, take a bunch of particles, and just evolve the particles under the action of a Hamiltonian? 
simple, right? I mean, if you were to write a computer code, right, it's computational astrophysics, this is like the simplest thing that you can do. Just take a Hamiltonian, evolve particles. The problem is in this room, there's 10 to the 28 particles, just roughly. And if you were to store this kind of stuff at double precision, this is five times 10 to the 17 terabytes of data. And that's at one moment. So that's at, at time t. Okay, now evolve the system. <laughs> um, so that's just impractical, right? There's also another reason, there, there's two other reasons not to do this kind of particle by particle approach. One is that the system is extremely sensitive to initial conditions. So if you just took one particle of these 10 to the 28 and you displaced it slightly and then hit go, you're gonna get a different answer in terms of where all the particles are at some future time. So it's chaotic. So the, you know, there, it's, it's not reproducible, so why would, you, why would you even bother with this? The third thing is, yeah, why would you even bother? You're not actually interested in the position and velocity of every single particle in this room. You're interested in some sort of macroscopic description. So why even muck around with this in the first place? And that's what underlies kinetic theory. So what you do is you come up with a probability distribution, right? So you say that at some time, in some, uh, in some interval of space, in some interval of velocity, I have a certain number of particles. And things are normalized such that if I integrate over that volume of velocity, I get number density. This thing is also such that if I take the first moment, I get momentum. If I take, uh, you know, we've already, I'll, I'll write this one because we've already done this. I get p perp. So you can extract all these sort of fluid quantities by taking moments of the probability distribution function. In fact, that's where all these MHD equations come from, and you can rigorously derive that. Some of it's done in the notes. So um, there is a semester course, more than half of which is deriving an evolution equation for F here. So I'm not going to derive that, but I'll, I'll write it down and we'll talk about it. Certain aspects of this you'll probably encounter in, kinetic, in your StatMet course or uh, in a classical mechanics course. So this is, let's pretend this right-hand side were zero. This is kind of like Louisville's theorem, kind of, right? Phase space is conserved. It's not exactly the same, but that's what a whole course is for. Um, so this is the velocity coordinate dotted into a gradient of the distribution function. This is all the accelerations in the system dotted into the velocity gradient of the distribution function. So this is just the full derivative of f, you know, just chain rolled out. And then there's the right-hand side, and this is collisions. It's written like that because it's a functional instead of a function, but you know, it's a function of a function. Um, so this is uh, when, so this thing is due to Landau, and this thing uh, is called Vlasov, or Boltzmann, or something like that. That's what it's Vlasov Landau. And what this does is it provides you with a statistical description of how the particles evolve without having to follow each individual particle. So this is coupled um, to Maxwell's equations. And uh, Professor Spikowski is going to talk about this, how to solve this system on a computer, right? It's, it's 6D, sometimes we say 3D, 3V, because it's three spatial dimensions, three velocity space dimensions, so it could be quite expensive. 
Um, on 57, page 57 of the notes, I have, um, I've listed, I haven't told you what this is, but I've listed some properties of it, like it conserves particle number, it conserves momentum of the system, it conserves energy of the system, it satisfies a Boltzmann H theorem, which means entropy always increases. Um, it's a Fokker-Planck operator, if you know what that means. Uh, right, so then there's a bunch of physics that you can pull out of this. Um, one's Landau damping which I talk about in the notes, and I refer to you to some notes by uh, Alexander Shekhashikhin, which I, is some really good lecture notes on, on Landau damping and phase mixing. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about that here, because it's not necessary for the, the rest of the talks. What I am gonna talk about in the, it's about 10 minutes, five minutes. is what happens if you really don't want to solve this? <clears throat> so even doing linear theory on here, you know, if, if, if you skip the linear theory homework, because uh, it's just old hat to you, and you have never done linear theory of Lasov maxwell set, you know, spend the week doing that. <laughs> um, it's extremely rich. There's all sorts of things. Um, and it's a lot more than not just a single talk, but even a class on, uh, on kinetic theory of waves would even cover. Um, so instead, what you want to do is you want to reduce this equation somehow. You, know, you want to remove some degrees of freedom. Um, you might want to remove some of the dimensions of the problem. Uh, you just do, want to do whatever you can do analytically to not have to solve this thing. Um, and in order to do so, that brings up something called asymptotic theory. And in asymptotics, you, dem you, you find some small parameter, which you call epsilon, and you order everything relative to this parameter. You know, maybe um, the fluctuations that I'm interested in divided by the Larmor frequency is small. Maybe that's true. Um, maybe the Larmor radius divided by the scales that I'm interested in, L, is small. Maybe uh, V over C is like, you know, epsilon squared or something like that. Maybe I'm non-relativistic non uh, or, you know, just zero or something like that. Um, so what you do is you identify these small parameters in your problem and you look at every single term in this equation and you figure out which ones are the, the biggest, which ones are the second biggest, which ones are the third biggest, and if you're really ambitious, you can go to fourth order. Um, and this is what underlies something called kinetic MHD. And uh, something called gyrokinetics. I don't have time to derive these here, but uh, I've given you a derivation in the notes. So if you really want to derive kinetic MHD, uh, you know, it's, it's here in, in about 10 or 15 pages. If you really want to know how gyrokinetics is, is derived, um, I've given sort of the simplest route to getting to gyrokinetics in, in about 10 pages in the notes. Um, and, you know, I live here, so you can, you can ask me. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. Um, what I will do is I'll tell you what goes, what orderings are in each of these. Um, so both of them use this. Both of them in their simplest form use that, so it's non-relativistic. Um, the, the, the Dubai length is also zero, so it's quasi-neutral, both of them. Um, so kinetic MHD has rho over any scale that you're interested in, order epsilon. Gyrokinetics has something a bit different. So, um, that's a small difference, but it's, it's, a huge, it's a huge difference in terms of what's captured by the equations. So this has, uh, there, the, the Larmor radius is not finite. So you never have any finite Larmor radius effects in this system of equations. Here, the Larmor radius is finite, but only with respect to one dimension, the, the dimensions perpendicular to the magnetic field. 
Um, you can have different orderings. I mean, in both of these orderings, um, you order things like the plasma beta could be just order one, which means that, yeah, beta could be 1% or beta could be 100, but it's not, it's not as small as this. Uh, you can have the mean free path divided by the length scales of interest. The standard der derivation of these um, says that it's one, which means later on you can take the mean free path to be zero or the mean free path to be small, but you're not building in any bias into the system of equations from the outset. So all that's done here. <laughs> um, right, so there's only one last thing that I want to say, which I have... <laughs> um, which comes out of these equations. <clears throat> and there are two instabilities. One is called fire hose, which is an alphane wave with So this is the magnetic tension. We talked about this in the first lecture. It's a restoring force. In this lecture, we've talked about pressure anisotropy. Now, it turns out if P parallel is bigger than these two things combined, these are the restoring forces, and this is a destabilizing force. And this alphane wave goes unstable. Um, and so you get sharp kinks in the magnetic field, which are of order of the Larmor scale. So it's extremely rapidly going instability. Um, it's derived in the notes, which I encourage you to take a look at. Uh, it appears in the solar wind. You can actually see it. Um, it's a hot topic in terms of black hole accretion and what the fire hose instability does to angular momentum transport and accretion disks and uh, heat transport in galaxy clusters um, and things like that. And then there's, an, there's several instabilities, but I'm just writing down two of them. One's called the mirror instability, which is polarized like a slow mode, and it looks like this. And the idea is that there's a bunch of particles in, these magnetic, in this magnetic bottle, and when you squeeze on this magnetic field, these particles are going to be shot. <clears throat> or at least the particles that are resonant with the wave. The, the particles that are at rest with respect to the wave, uh, when you squeeze this field, those particles get pushed into this weak field region. And if those particles are characterized <coughs> by a P perp, which is bigger than a restoring magnetic pressure force and this restoring parallel force, these field lines blow out. <coughs> And this is called the mirror instability. And both fire hose and mirror are seen in the solar wind. Um, they're very important for regulating heat transport and providing the effect of collisionality in a collisionless plasma. Um, we're just now really starting to understand the effect of these guys on the transport properties of astrophysical systems, so it's a bit of a hot topic. Um, and I'm out of time, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat>